If you've got your Bibles with you, uh, if you would uh, mind turning with me, please, to the prophecy of Isaiah and chapter 62, Isaiah 62. It's only 12 verses, and yet I think you'll find that it's not only packed full of interesting information, but very profitable, uh, I believe, to all of us uh, as we consider it. So verse 1 in Isaiah 62, it says this, For Zion's sake... Will I not hold my peace? And for Jerusalem's sake, I will not rest until the righteousness thereof go forth as brightness and the salvation thereof as a lamp that burneth. And the Gentiles shall see thy righteousness and all kings thy glory. And thou shalt be called by a new name, which the mouth of the Lord shall name. Thou shalt also be a crown of glory in the hand of the Lord, and a royal diadem in the hand of thy God. Thou shalt no more be termed forsaken, neither shall thy land any more be termed desolate. But thou shalt be called Hephzibah, and thy land Beulah, for the Lord delighteth in thee, and thy land shall be married. For as a young man marrieth a virgin, so shall thy sons marry thee. And as the bridegroom rejoiceth over the bride, so shall thy God rejoice over thee. I have set watchmen upon thy walls, O Jerusalem, which shall never hold their peace day nor night. Ye that make mention of the Lord, keep not silence and give him no rest till he establisheth until he make Jerusalem a praise in the earth. The Lord has sworn by his right hand and by the arm of his strength, surely I will no more give thy corn to be meat for thine enemies, and the sons of the stranger shall not drink thy wine for the which thou hast labored. But they that have gathered it shall eat it and praise the Lord. And they that have brought it together shall drink it in the courts of my holiness. Go through, go through the gates, prepare ye the way of the people. Cast up, cast up the highway, gather out the stones, lift up a standard for the people. Behold, the Lord hath proclaimed unto the end of the world. Say ye to the daughter of Zion, behold, thy salvation cometh. Behold, his reward is with him and his work before him. And they shall call them the holy people, the redeemed of the Lord. And thou shalt be called, sought out, a city not forsaken. And again, God always blesses the reading of his precious word uh, to our hearts. Well, this is a prayer. Uh, the first part of chapter 62 is a prayer by an individual and then later on in verse six, we have a group of people known as watchmen who are encouraged to pray and to st not stop day or night. And so it's a, there's a lot of practical lessons, even though this is about Israel and their future. There's a lot of practical lessons about prayer in this message for all of us, I believe. But there's this petition uh, that is found in verse one. And, of course, the big question that hangs over this chapter is who, is, who is it that is praying? Who is this person who's making this petition? And, of course, the petition is in connection with the blessings that we've considered together in chapter 60 and 61. The petition is made to God to implement the promises that we saw in 60 and 61, where, once again, Israel will be uh, the head of the nations uh, when uh, they will be uh, glorified, no longer disobedient to the Lord. They'll be in a place of intimacy with him. And Jerusalem will be, as it were, the administrative capital of the world and the nations will flow into it. And we could say this, that there, there never will be righteousness and peace on this earth until this prayer is answered until Jerusalem gets her new name and becomes a crown of glory in the hand of the Lord. When that happens, then there'll be peace on this planet. Then 
the world will enjoy righteousness and all of the things that frustrate us now will be gone. So I said, the big question, of course, is who is the speaker? And there are lots of answers that have been suggested uh, by Bible commentators, commentators down through the years. Uh, some have suggested that it's God that's speaking. Uh, others that it's the church, which is, again, reading into the text, really. It's not the church, that's for sure, uh, because they were a mystery hidden in previous ages. Uh, some think it's preachers. Some it's Isaiah that's making this petition. But I like best of all, and I, I mean, have in good company with a lot of others, believing that this is actually a petition of Messiah himself. Of course, we're not, to, not a stranger to the idea of him praying on behalf of his people. Uh, we've, we've seen that before. Uh, we, we see in Psalm 2, where the Lord tells uh, the Lord Jesus, ask of me and I'll give you the heathen for your inheritance, the uttermost parts of the earth for your uh, for your inheritance, for your possession. And so the, we, we see him asking for the heathen, for the, for the planet earth, as it were, to be his. Now, in this passage, I believe he is asking for Zion to be glorified and to occupy that central place that it was ever intended to be in the purposes of God. And so notice again, just that verse one, for Zion's sake, will I hold not my peace? It was Messiah is not going to give up, not going to hold his peace. And for Jerusalem's sake, I will not rest until the righteousness thereof go forth as brightness and the salvation thereof as a lamp that burneth. And so the idea is that here is the Messiah, the Lord Jesus, praying for them. Amazing grace, really, isn't it? Of course, he, he prayed for this city before, praying for Jerusalem, praying for it to be uh, here praying that it will be glorified but he prayed for it once before in fact he wept over the city and he said how often would i have gathered thy children as a hen gathers her chicks under her wing but you would not and so he he wept over this city he prayed for this city even when he was being crucified he was praying father forgive them they don't know what they're doing and so he certainly has a prayer interest in this city and he's telling us now like Boaz of old, that he will not rest until the matter is settled and Zion is given its rightful place. The reference to Boaz, I want you just to go back with me, please, just for a second to the book of Ruth. And this is uh, where I make this connection. Um, if you go back to, to the, the book of Ruth and <clears throat> chapter 3 and verse 18, it says, then said she, sit still, my daughter, until thou know how the matter will fall, for the man will not be in rest until he have finished the thing this day. This kinsman redeemer, uh, the confidence that Naomi had was he's not going to rest until this thing is finished. And we can say with equal confidence that the heavenly Boaz, the, the true kinsman redeemer is not going to rest until these things that are described here. I will not hold my peace for Jerusalem's sake. I will not rest until the righteousness thereof go forth as a brightness, the salvation thereof as a lamp that burneth. And so he's not going to rest until these things be accomplished. And so the Lord Jesus is intent on the blessing and the glory of his earthly people. And it's good to know, by the way, that that same Lord Jesus is also intent on the blessing and the glory of his heavenly people, the church. Let me just read you one scripture from John 17, and we'll go back then to our passage. But in John chapter 17, there's a lovely scripture where the Lord is praying for his heavenly people. And this is what he says. In John 17 and verse 24, he says, Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. Isn't that a wonderful thought? 
that actually he wants us to be with him where he is and he wants us to behold his glory and of course that's our wonderful prospect and again it's it's his desire it's his longing for the blessing of us his heavenly people just in the same way he is intent on the blessing here of his earthly people now when it says for zion's sake zion without question is a reference to jerusalem the the earthly capital of israel and it's forever associated with david uh, david's city and of course there was a promise made in the davidic covenant that one of his descendants would always sit on his throne and of course the lord jesus is that one who is going to come and fulfill the davidic covenant and sit on that throne and it will be in zion mount zion uh, the sides of the north, the city of the great king. In fact, Psalm 2 again, yet have I set my king on my holy hill of Zion. And so again, we've got to emphasize this. This is speaking of a literal city, and it has to be stressed. Uh, just last night, I heard somebody and they were singing, we're marching to Zion, beautiful, beautiful Zion. We're marching to Zion, the, the beautiful city of God. And we tend to think of that in terms of the heavenly Mount Zion. But in a very real sense, Mount Zion in Jerusalem uh, is going to be the place that will one day be the, the capital of the millennial earth. And that certainly is what is in view here. The one who is much more than the earthly Boaz, the heavenly Boaz, will not rest until Zion's righteousness will be manifest. It, it, publicly as brightness and her salvation her bliss her fullness her happiness as a burning lamp it'll be on display for all to see and it says that verse 2 the gentiles shall see thy righteousness and all kings thy glory this city uh, will be a city of righteousness not as it's co called in the book of revelation remember in the book of revelation it's called sodom and egypt uh, certainly not in that place right now, but in a coming day, it will be a place of righteousness and a people of righteousness will dwell there. And of course, where will they get that righteousness? Well, uh, another prophet helps us out here. Uh, it's not their own righteousness, but like us, we don't have any righteousness of our own. There's none righteous, no, not one, but we get it from the Lord Jesus, his righteousness put to our account. and. Back in another prophet, Jeremiah 23, verse 6, we have a lovely statement. It says, in this day, Judah shall be saved and Israel shall dwell safely. And this is his name, whereby he shall be called the Lord, our righteousness. And of course, uh, we often perhaps sing that hymn in the black hymn book, Jehovah sit can you? Uh, that's the idea of the Lord, our righteousness. And so they'll be righteous because they'll be not trying to establish their own righteousness, which they've done in the past, but they'll submit themselves to the righteousness of God. They'll believe in the finished work of Christ. They'll look on him whom they pierce. They'll mourn for him. And the fountain will be open for sin and uncleanness. And this people will be righteous. And the capital, in a sense, of world uh, righteousness, in a sense, will be Jerusalem. And it says, the Gentiles shall see thy righteousness, the king's thy glory. And you'll be called, he says, by a new name, which the mouth of the Lord shall name. I want to think a little bit about this new name for a moment. Because quite often in the Bible, there's giving of a new name. And it usually is the pledge of a, an action on God's part to change the status of the individual whose name has been changed. And so, for instance, back in the book of Genesis, and, and you, you can probably think of lots of examples, we'll throw out a few of them here, but back in Genesis, for instance, uh, it was twice in chapter 17, uh, you have names being changed. And of course, it implies new relationship, new status, all of these things. And so he says, verse five of Genesis 17, neither shall thy name anymore be called Abram, but thy name shall be Abraham, for a father of many nations 
have I made thee? Verse 15, God said to Abraham, as for Sarai, thy wife, thou shalt not call her name Sarai, but shall call her Sarah, shall her name be. So he's changing their names, and, and it was to do with their status. They're no longer going to be barren. Uh, they're going to be fruitful from them. Uh, multitude would come uh, from make many nations out of them. And so we, we see it, this idea of God pledging a divine change uh, in the person's status or character. And we've got others. We, we've, of course, Jacob to Israel. Uh, we have uh, Simon to Peter. We have Saul to Paul. And we could go on and on. So this new name has the idea of a new status. Uh, a change is, is being are brought about by God. And so he's going to give Zion a new name, which is going to emerge. And I believe in verse 4, at least we get a hint, uh, clearly, of the changes that are going to occur in connection with name changes. And uh, so uh, we'll, we'll deal with that when we get there. But I want you just to focus on this idea of that it says... Um, Thou shalt be called by a new name, which the mouth of the Lord shall name. Now, a number of times in Isaiah, we've had this phrase, the mouth of the Lord. And it's usually in connection with grace that is being brought from God to people. And so, for instance, back in Isaiah 40 and verse 5, it says, The glory of the Lord shall be revealed. All flesh shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. Of course, that glory of the Lord being revealed is really, he's preparing the way for the coming of Messiah. The glory of the Lord shall be revealed. The mouth of the Lord has spoken it. Surely that was speaking of grace being brought to people. Isaiah 58, just back a couple of pages, and verse 14. Again, this mouth of the Lord speaking, connected with God acting in grace towards his people. It says, and thou shalt, then shalt thou delight thyself in the Lord, and I will cause thee to ride upon the high places of the earth and feed thee with the heritage of Jacob thy father, for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it, cause you to rise on the high places of the earth. In other words, you've got some mountaintop experiences up ahead that God had promised to his people. And again, it's God dealing with them in grace. And so here again, he talks about going to be a new name, and of course it means a new kind of disposition, new place, new position, and with that, the mouth of the Lord is going to bring this to pass. And it says in verse 3, thou shalt also be a crown of glory in the hand of the Lord and a royal diadem in the hand of thy God. A crown, a diadem in the hand of God. In other words, a crown, a diadem, something very special, isn't it? Uh, not everybody has a crown uh, in terms of a royal crown or a diadem. And God is going to view them as his special people, and they're going to be held in his hand. Uh, he's going to hold them uh, like a crown of glory and like a royal diadem in his hands. Now, again, I want to think about this idea of his hands. because. There's no safer place to be than in his hands. And again, I, I'm sure some of you are already thinking of a passage in the Gospel of John chapter 10, where we talk about the hand of the Lord and what a secure place that proves to be. In John's Gospel chapter 10 and verse 28, so it's a lovely statement of the eternal security of the believer. Somebody who's put their finished uh, their trust in the finished work of the Lord Jesus, the Lord says to this, I give unto them eternal life. Now, if he gives you anything less than eternal life, you've been sold a bill of goods, but he won't because he keeps his promise. He gives you eternal life and he says, and they shall never perish. That's a promise. That's a guarantee. Neither, he says, shall any man pluck them out of my hand. It was you're so secure because you're in the hands of the Savior. And in order to get out of that hand, you have to be stronger than him to be able to release that grip. And you're not. But in case you thought you were and you, I can get out of his hand, then he says, my father 
which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my father's hand. So, so the idea is this, that the child of God in this New Testament age, he's, got, he's in the hand of Christ, and then he's in the hand of the father, and he is seriously gripped. <laughs> to get out of that, you have to be stronger than God the Father and God the Son, and you're not, so you're secure. What a safe place to be. Good to be in his hands, isn't it? It's a wonderful place to be, and of course, Israel, in a coming day, are going to be a crown of glory in the hand of the Lord, a royal diadem in the hand of thy God. And then we're going to get to this new name business. It says, thou shalt no more be termed forsaken, neither shalt thy land any more be termed desolate, but thou shalt be called Hephzibah, in thy land Beulah, for the Lord delighteth in thee, and thy land shall be married. Now again, some of you that know anything about uh, kind of old gospel songs, uh, you probably would have sung one called Beulah Land. And uh, these, these words would be more familiar to you, maybe some of the oldest names. But the idea here is that Israel's trials will one day be forgotten, when she gets this new name, Hepzibah, which means my delight is in her. Isn't that wonderful? What a wonderful thing for God to say to, to a place, Zion, and to a people that will be gathered there, my delight is in her. It's wonderful, isn't it, to be, be, be delighted in by the Lord. And he says they're no longer going to be known by their old name of desolate or forsaken but instead they're going to be beulah which means married now it's interesting that some of the names here if you're reading in the hebrew for instance the word forsaken is the word azuba and actually it was a real name of a real person and hepzibah was also a real name of a real person actual names in ancient Israel. For instance, King Jehoshaphat's mother in 1 Kings chapter 22, and I'll just read it to you, 1 Kings chapter 22, she, Jehoshaphat's mother, was called Azuba. And so let me just read it. 1 Kings 22 and verse 42, it says this, and Jehoshaphat was 35 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 20 and 5 years in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Azuba, the daughter of Shehili. Now, here's the interesting thing. What father would ever want to call their daughter Azuba? Now, Azuba sounds nice, but what it means is forsaken. Here's my daughter, and what, what do you call your little girl? Forsaken. I don't think that would be a popular name to call your little girl, would it? And, uh, and then Hepzibah was also a real person's name, much more positive name than Azuba. And that is the name given to the mother of wicked King Manasseh. Remember, he was uh, the son of Hezekiah. And if you look at 2 Kings chapter 21 and verse 1, we'll see that. 2 Kings 21. In verse 1, Manasseh was 12 years old when he began to reign and reigned 50 and 5 years in Jerusalem and his mother's name was Hepzibah. Hepzibah, my delight is in her. So obviously, that's a, it's a lovely name that a father would give to their little girl, right? My delight is in her. And perhaps uh, certainly in the, the eyes of uh, Hezekiah, he delighted in his wife. Uh, but God is saying that I am going to change the name of Israel uh, and of Zion, and it's no longer going to be known as forsaken, as Azuba, nor is it going to be termed desolate. And of course, if you remember their history, uh, I've got this interesting book that talks about pilgrimages to the Holy Land uh, during the medieval period. Uh, and even as, as late as uh, the author of Huckleberry uh, Finn, Mark Twain, uh, he went 
uh, to the land of Israel. And he said it was, it was desolate. He couldn't imagine it supporting life. This was before 1948. And of course, the children of Israel going back there, of course, now it's very different. But then it was, it was totally and utterly desolate. It was a forsaken land and had been for centuries of, of mismanagement. Uh, it was a terrible place. And he says, you're no longer going to be called forsaken, no longer going to be termed desolate, but you'll be known as Hepzibah. My delight is in the and Beulah, which means married. And so great changes up ahead for that land, a land that the Lord delights in. Now, again, I love that the Lord delighteth in thee because it says that about his servant, the servant of Jehovah in Isaiah 42, the very same language is used of what God thinks of his son the servant of Jehovah. Behold my servant, whom I uphold, mine elect, in whom my soul delighteth. And so the very way that he thinks of his son delights in him. In a coming day, Zion and the people that live there, God will delight in them like he delights in his son. What a wonderful prospect for them. And so then verse five, it says, for as a young man marrieth a virgin, so shall thy sons marry thee. Kind of seems strange, don't it? Your sons will marry you, speaking of a city. But I guess it's not unusual for to talk of loyal citizens to be married to their city. Uh, and his love, we're told, will be so strong and full of joy, like somebody who's newly married. Uh, the young bridegroom has gained and joys in the beauty of his bride so will your children gain their beloved city and rejoice in its beauty and so it's just telling us that the nation of israel are going to just delight in this beautiful city when it's the metropolitan as it were a capital of of the millennial earth they're going to delight in it rejoicing in it in its beauty and of course when he says in verse four that uh, thy land shall be married, it indicates the land will be cared for and protected and no more abandoned because God is not going to abandon that land. In fact, back in Deuteronomy, he talked about the, a land that the Lord cares for and the eyes of the Lord thy God are always upon it from the beginning of the year, even to the end of the year. And once again, it won't be forsaken. It won't be desolate. It'll be married. It'll be cared for. God will take a personal vested interest in that land to care for it, to protect it. And it will never be abandoned again. So what a glorious future. And then verse six, it moves from Messiah's petition. And he tells us about others that he has got to join him in this petition. So he says, I again, speaking of Messiah, have set watchmen upon thy walls, O Jerusalem, which shall never hold their peace, day nor night. Ye that make mention of the Lord, keep not silence, give him no rest till he establish, until he make Jerusalem the praise of the earth. And so the idea is this, that, that the Lord is raising up faithful watchmen who will constantly remind God of his promises concerning Zion. Give him no rest until he establishes Jerusalem and makes her the praise of the earth. Don't stop. Keep reminding God. Keep on to him until this occurs. Of course, we're told in scripture, aren't we? Psalm 122 verse 6, to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And so there are watchmen that God has raised up and they're raised up to pray and remind God about these very promises concerning Zion, concerning Jerusalem, and not to ever let him forget them. So just kind of summarizing these thoughts, what we've got so far is this. The Lord himself will not rest with regard to Zion, right? He says, for Zion's sake, verse 1, I'll not hold my peace. For Jerusalem's sake, I will not rest. So the law is not going to rest regarding Zion. He doesn't want his petitioners 
to keep silence in their prayers concerning Jerusalem. So he says, I've set these watchmen on your walls, verse 6. Ye that make mention of the Lord, keep not silence. And so he says, don't keep silent. Keep speaking to the Lord about this. And then thirdly, he doesn't want his people to leave him alone concerning Israel's deliverance. Give him no rest till he establish, till he make Jerusalem a praise in the earth. Now, lots of lessons about prayer here. First of all, we could say this. First of all, it began in the heart of the Messiah. I have set watchmen. And it's true to say that prayer really begins with God putting it into the heart of somebody to pray. In other words, it starts from the throne and it goes back to the throne, but he's the initiator. And so true prayer begins as well as ends at the throne of God. And it's guided by the spirit of God. So God is really involved in this whole process. And so God is stirring these watchmen to pray. And of course, it's not that God needs reminding, but he graciously involves us in his work. It's not that God says, well, you know, I, there's a good, good possibility that I may forget about Jerusalem. He's not going to forget. He's not going to forget his promises, but he's saying, I actually want you to be part of my work. I want you to have a part. And this is a good part you can have. You keep on reminding me about my promises concerning Jerusalem. Don't ever stop. You keep bringing them to me. And of course, there's a great lesson in, in the idea of, of not giving up in prayer and of pleading the promises of God before him. So we could do that in lots of ways. He said uh, he's not willing that any should perish, that he'd have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Be good to remind God of his promises and don't give him any rest until it happens. Maybe it's somebody you want to see saved. Don't give him any rest until he establishes. It's interesting, isn't it? He says, give him no rest till he establish. I wonder how much is not established in our lives simply because we stop praying. We stop knocking, we stop asking. He wants to cultivate in us a relationship of faith and perseverance, of affection and communication with our heavenly father. And he wants us to be watchmen on the walls who pray and who persist in prayer, to be the Lord's remembrances, what a wonderful title, to be a remembrancer of the Lord, to, to remind him of his promises. And so they're, they're charged with this. And again, it's not, uh, it's not that God is re needs pressurizing because he's reluctant to bless his people. But uh, his purpose is to bring Jerusalem to the place of metropolitan glory. But he wants us to have a part in it all. He wants us to share in his work. He wants us to, uh, as it were, by faith, lay hold of his promises and bring them before him. And so how we need to be those that persevere in prayer. And, of course, there's always victory when we persevere in prayer. Back in Exodus 17, there's the story of Moses, and there's a battle going on against Amalek. Uh, down below in the valley, Joshua is fighting against Amalek. And while Moses' hand was raised, Joshua prevailed. People of Israel prevailed against Amalek. And when his hands fell down, Amalek prevailed. And so the idea is this. We need to not let our hands down. We need to keep on laying hold of God that he will accomplish his purposes and accomplish his promises. And... In the announcements today, there was a little bit of a plug about the midweek prayer meeting. I, if I was remembering rightly, I think that's what Dale mentioned and was encouraging people to go to the prayer meeting. And God is saying, I want watchmen. I want remembrances that will remind me of my promises. Will you be one of those this week and go out of your way to go to the meeting of the saints? And he says, I will, therefore. 1 Timothy 2.8, concerning the house of God, 
that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. Let's lay hold of God in prayer. And so verse 8, he said, The Lord has sworn by his right hand and by the arm of his strength. Surely I will no more give thy corn to be meat for thine enemies, and the sons of the stranger shall not drink thy wine for that which thou hast labored. So here there's a solemn oath now. God is swearing, or Messiah is swearing here. Uh, he is taking an oath. And it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful to see. The Lord hath sworn by his right hand. And so he takes this solemn oath. And, um, of course, when he takes an oath, you know he's going to fulfill it. And we, we see, for instance, and just to, I read you one other scripture in Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 13. Just a beautiful scripture about the Lord taking, as it were, the stand and making it an oath or a promise in, in Hebrews 6 and verse 13. For when God made promise to Abraham because he could swear by no greater he swear by himself, saying, surely blessing I'll bless thee, and multiply and I'll multiply. So after that he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. And so the idea is this, that God is making a promise to the nation of Israel, that once they're established, back in the land, in, the, in this millennial period, when Jerusalem will be the praise of the earth, when It'll be Hepzibah and Beulah land. When that happens, he says, I'm going to swear to you, something's going to happen. Something is not going to happen that's happened to you many times before. He says, I will no more give you a corn to be meat for thine enemies, and the sons of the stranger shall not drink your wine. Because throughout their history, much of the history of Zion, <laughs> it had been subject to attack and assault from her enemies and they had robbed armies had robbed her of her food supplies uh, you look at daniel chapter 11 and the wars between the king of the north and the king of the south and of course uh, the king of the south was in egypt the king of the north was in syria and uh, to to get at each other they had to come through the land of israel and so the army marches on its stomach and so they would march through the land of israel and they would basically steal the harvest from the children of israel uh, whether they're coming up from egypt or coming down from syria and that's been their long history of other nations uh, either by taxation uh, like the romans or by just kind of coming through and stealing their their food supplies and god is swearing here and notice he says he has sworn by his right hand because the right hand speaks of the right hand of his power. So not only has he uh, the faithfulness that when he swears, it's, it's, it's going to be true, but he also has the ability in the power of his right hand to make it happen, to bring it about. And so he says, he sworn by his right hand, by the arm of his strength, surely I'll no more give you a corn to be meat for your enemies. And the sons of the stranger shall not drink your wine for which you have labored. And of course, their vineyards, uh, again, others had come through and stolen them. And so he says, that's not going to happen. It's happened a lot in your history, uh, many, many times. But in this coming day, when you're no longer desolate, when you're no longer forsaken, when you're, you're, my delight is in you, when you're married, then that will never occur again. In fact, in verse 9, he says, But they that have gathered it shall eat it and praise the Lord, and they that have brought it together shall drink it in the courts of my holiness. And it's speaking of the fact that they'll come up to Jerusalem at the various festivals. Remember the, 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 the Feast of Jehovah, um, at, at least three of them were harvest festivals. And they were an opportunity to come and praise the Lord for an abundant harvest and so they would come up uh, for first fruits uh, uh, and bring uh, their uh, kind of first fruits of their harvest to show their goodness the goodness of the lord the, the barley harvest which was time of passover uh, and, and then uh, at the 
uh, the wheat harvest, which was at the time of Pentecost, and then the corn and wine harvest, which was at the Feast of Tabernacles. And so the idea is the picture of the worshippers offering the harvest first fruits to the Lord and rejoicing before him. Now, again, we want to make this practical. We said there's lessons in this for prayer, and here's a lesson for all of us. It reminds us that when we receive food from the Lord or any material benefit, food and raiment, that we should be in the habit of praising him for his provision. And so he says, verse 9, they that have gathered it shall eat it and praise the Lord. And so this idea of when you sit down to eat, to give thanks to God for the food, it shouldn't be just some kind of ritualistic thing, but there ought to be genuine praise to God that I have food to eat today in abundance compared to many on this earth. The Lord has been good to us and we need to be quick to praise him for his provision. That food that we have to be sanctified by the word of God and prayer, 1 Timothy 4, 5, to be a thankful people. And then he says in verse 10, go through, go through the gates, prepare ye the way of the people, cast up, cast up the highway, gather up out the stones, lift up a standard for the people. Behold, the Lord has proclaimed to the end of the world. The world say ye to the daughter of Zion, behold, thy salvation cometh, behold, his reward is with him and his work before him. And so the idea is that there's a highway. We've, we've seen it mentioned a few times uh, in the book of Isaiah. Uh, remember, make straight the ways of the Lord in Isaiah chapter 40, uh, filling in uh, the valleys and, and leveling the mountains, make, as it were, make a highway uh, to prepare the way for the coming of Messiah. Well, that's the language that's used here. And there's an urgency about it. The Lord is coming to do these things. The Lord is coming to establish Zion. And so there's a need for preparation, a need to prepare the way of the people, cast up, cast up the highways, gather out the stones, lift up the standard of the people. It was get the roads ready and then lift up a banner, a standard to say it's ready. Everything's prepared for the coming of not only the Lord, but of his returning people who will literally be marching to Zion, beautiful, beautiful Zion, marching to Zion, the beautiful city of God. And so the highways will be prepared, as it were, for the massive pilgrimages to the city to see the wonderful things that God has done uh, for this nation in restoring them to a place of glory in Jerusalem and a banner of proclam and a proclamation is to be made. And that banner, that proclamation is to go to the ends of the earth. Behold, the Lord has proclaimed to the end of the world, say ye to the daughter of Zion, behold, thy salvation cometh. And of course, that salvation that they're so waiting for, it's going to come. And it says, thy salvation cometh, his reward is with him and his work before him. Does that remind you of any scripture that you might have read? I want you to go to Revelation 22, just for a second. Because their salvation is in the same person as our salvation. There's only one Savior. Old Testament Israel was saved. The saved Jews looking forward to the coming of Messiah. We're saved looking back. But ultimately their final deliverance will be as a nation when they look on him whom they've pierced. And, and Revelation 22, verse 12 says this, Behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give every man according as his work shall be. Who is the one that's saying, Behold, I come quickly? Well, it's the Lord Jesus. And it says, My reward is with me. Now again, back in our passage, say to the daughter of Zion, behold, thy salvation cometh. So who is their salvation coming from? It's from the Lord Jesus. And his reward is with him. And his work before him. And of course, his work was done. To provide all this future blessing for the nation, our future blessing in eternity, 
his work was done at Calvary. And it prepared the way for this time of great blessing. And as a result of this, it says they shall call them, this nation. They shall call them the holy people, the redeemed of the Lord. And thou shalt be called, sought out, a city not forsaken. Speaking once again of Zion, sought out, a city not forsaken. So we've been looking at the program of God. And it certainly centers around this place called Jerusalem. We want to see peace on planet Earth. Well, it's never going to come. Peace or righteousness until Jerusalem becomes Hepzibah. My delight is in her. Beulah, married. In that day, and of course, the Lord is saying, I'm not going to rest until it happens. And he's telling us, don't give me any rest. Don't give God any rest until all these promises come to pass. Are we reminding the Lord of his promises? These are the future blessings that will come to this earth. And they're going to come through the work and person of none other than Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, we're thankful once again for the privilege of studying thy wonderful word. Oh, Lord, how beautiful it is, how it fits so nicely together. Thank you that you're in the business of making changes. And often this new name is connected with it. And we're thankful, Lord, that you brought changes to our lives. We used to have a name, Sinner, and now we have a new name, Saint because of what Christ did for us on Calvary. And we just are so grateful for the marvelous work of the Savior. And Lord, we am we're amazed that you want us to be part of your program, that you want us to enlist us, as it were, as watchmen, to join you in your work by asking us to pray and to remind you and to give you no rest until you establish, until you make Jerusalem a praise in the earth. Lord, help us to be faithful watchmen, and we'll give thee the glory in Jesus' name. Amen.